been a long road since the original kicker christened that first pickup truck. It kicked off a car audio renaissance, and upgrading your music in a vehicle was a requirement. America's music machine became live and loud with your passion, your emotion, your existence. Outdoors or on the open road, your sound is kicker. Do not attempt to adjust this transmission. We have assumed control. The year is 1980. Music fights for its very survival in an acoustically desolate wasteland man calls automobile. Enter Steve Irby, a man whose love of music helped end the scourge forever and forge a path for modern car audio to follow. A humble musician with a passion for quality sound, Mr. Irby is a man who feels it is his destiny to provide a sanctuary for mobile audio. Welcome. Join us this evening as we venture back to the very night a young Steve Irby gains his inspiration to create the legacy we know today as Kicker Performance Audio. Though he does not realize it now, by this time tomorrow, Mr. Irby will have completed blueprints for the original Kicker and champion the war against mobile audio inequality. Tonight, Mr. Irby's prayers will be answered as he begins his quest into the Q Zone. Kicker L7QB8. With roots dating back to Kicker's inception, Mr. Irby and his team of engineers have achieved an unrivaled level of design and functionality. With extraordinary bass and a minimal footprint, the L7QB8 utilizes a seamless quarter-inch extruded aluminum housing, allowing optimal internal air volume for the subwoofer. This exclusive design provides exceptional strength and stability. Like the original Kicker, the L7QB8 incorporates a unique passive radiator to minimize required airspace while optimizing the efficiency and frequency response of the subwoofer. Opposite the passive radiator, the L7QB8 is equipped with the all-new 8-inch L7 square subwoofer. The 2016 L7 features an aluminum basket for exceptional strength and thin aluminum beat sinks for efficient heat dissipation. Kicker's blue lace spire, solo cone 360 degree back bracing, and a laser etched cone brace combine as a single ultra rigid unit. The result is increased clarity, higher volume, and added reliability. The square cone features over 20% more surface area than round subwoofers. It's attached to a Santaprene surround, then stitched to the cone for long life and durability. This surround features Kicker's patented rib corners, which fully dictates cone motion and extends surround life. At the base of the unit, a pair of custom form flanges integrate seamlessly with an extremely low profile mounting system, consisting simply of a mounting plate and ball. Once installed, the overall height of the enclosure is only nine and a half inches. This profile is small enough to work perfectly in countless trucks, sedans, and SUVs. Once again, Kicker sets a new standard with the groundbreaking design and unparalleled performance of the all-new L7 QB8.
the heavens. Saucer-shaped objects confirmed all over the world. Unidentified flying K saucers spotted delivering Kicker's amazing new Comp Q Super Woofer. Built for precision. Built for abuse. Built for the future and benefit of mankind. Kicker's new Comp Q Woofer leaves audiences astounded and amazed as it reveals subtleties in their favorite music in a way that is sure to make women blush and grown men cry. The surround features Kicker's variable cross-section high roll design, allowing extended cone travel and excellent cone control. It's firmly attached to the cone, reinforced with our iconic stitching. Betsy Ross would be so proud. The injection molded solo cone and laser X cone brace combined in a single ultra-rigid unit. Venting in the brace relieves performance robbing back pressure. All this adds up to very low distortion and amazingly clean low bass. Progressive roll blue Lace Spider adds even more cone control at maximum excursion. The woven tinsel leads are sandwiched between the spider and the lace for durability and long life and to prosper. The spring terminal's heavy-duty square design accepts wires as big as 8-gauge or two 12-gauge wires for multi-sub installations. The high-temp voice coil is rumored to be spun upon the looms of the gods of polyamide fiberglass, along with a reinforced former for high strength and power handling. Now, add colossal magnets, plus a cavernous bump back plate, an extended pole piece created in a single forging, the likes that haven't been seen since the creation of Poseidon's Trident. And the result is a driver with superior control and effective heat dissipation that extreme performance demands. The all new Kicker Comp Q is designed from the ground up to deliver everything you demand from a premium subwoofer, high output, deep, powerful, accurate bass, remarkably small enclosure requirements, stunning good looks, and not to mention the ability to frighten small children when turned up to 11. So there you have it, the all-new Kicker Comp Q subwoofer, another zenith of innovation and epic majesty from Kicker. I built my first speaker uh, to be louder. I was playing in a band and the drummer played so loud and the keyboard that I had wouldn't play very loud and I went to my dad and said, I need a bigger speaker. It's a Fender Bandmaster, it cost $300. He dropped the newspaper and said, $300? Yeah, but he didn't say no. He said, is it something that we could build? And so that's how I got started building speakers. The thing that, that I love to see is a product that we made and get to stand back kind of anonymously and watch somebody take a look at it, listen to it, and go, wow. I think that's what really lights my fire is to make products that people enjoy and have fun with. As time went on, I heard people say, you know, Kicker's like a family. I actually didn't set out to do that. Uh, I thought it sounded kind of hokey. I thought they were insincere. And just saying that, after a few years, I realized, uh, yeah, maybe that's, maybe that's what we've got. And that's the key is the good people on your team in the band that makes the band really great. Well, I think Kicker is primarily a lifestyle company. That's a little backwards of where I started. I thought we were a technology company and uh, we would make great products, but as time went on, realized that it's about people and uh, helping people to enjoy their life and what they do. And that's what I do too. So share the love a little bit, I guess. <laughs> Oh, my God.
It's Kip here with the Kicker Unmasked Live Tuesday night show. Yep. Seven thirty Central Times we kick it off. You notice I have a special guest over to my left here. Glad to be here. It's Mr. Steve Irving himself. Yeah. We call him we call him the landlord. <laughs> he had to pick up his rent check for the I week. Did. And see how we're taking care of the place. I haven't got the check yet. Kip. <laughs> well, the, the show's not over. So okay. hang on. The check is in the mail. It's Steve. in the mail. All right. Okay. You know, Steve. Actually, we are. Uh, it's very. Mm. Uh, he's a very busy guy. We had an opportunity to get him here on the show tonight, so we took full advantage of it. He joined us for dinner tonight. As you know, we feed the whole crew yeah. before we kick it off. We powwow, uh, kind of discuss how the show's going to go. So Steve chose where we had dinner tonight, and that was... Boba Fusion. Boba Fusion. If you ever find yourself in the Stillwater, Oklahoma area, it's one of the best Asian-style food restaurants. Yeah, a little bit of everything. A yeah. little bit. Fusion fits. Right, right. So thanks for joining us. we got Tim back behind the yeah. cameras this week. we got Ernie in his place where he needs to be, which is back running the switching console. Jeremy Wynn's back there giving him a hand with the lower thirds and other things. He's going to be watching for some comments to be able to put up on screen. And as always, Bill Frog Brown back there. He's answering questions, posting things out there. Get things kicked off so you got plenty yeah. of time. We've kind of gotten this habit where we reward you for tuning into the show live. So we have got a drawing going on tonight. The link that you'll see that's scrolling across the bottom is kicker.fun <clears throat> forward slash Steve Q and A. So if you'd like to grab that link, it'll be live until 830. Yep. We'll shut down all entries at 830 and then we'll pull for the winners. There's going to be three prizes and they are going to be, well, I'm not going to tell you quite yet, but there's going to be three prizes and I think you're going to like what they are. So be sure to hit that link, go enter. And then these prizes all also, as always, are courtesy of kicker, which really means they're courtesy mm. of Mr. Steve Irby That's himself. Right. So with that said, Steve, I don't know how many of these people may or may not know the history of our company or how it was even right. started, but if you could, I've, I've got some questions I want to ask you, and then I'm okay. going to be watching the feed for other great questions. So if you have some great questions for Steve, tonight's the night to ask those. So put them up in the feed so we can grab yeah. those. And Steve, how did you start Kicker or Stillwater Designs as a company? Well, actually, we started as Stillwater Designs with the idea that if building speakers didn't work out, you know, maybe we could use a name for something else, but <clears throat> it turned, it worked out okay, I'd have to say, you know. I'd, I'd say so far it's working out really well <laughs> yeah. for you. But um, no, that was a, kind of go back my history and audio was, uh, went clear back to high school, really, playing in a rock and roll band and uh, needing some more sound for my keyboard and uh, playing with a drummer that, you're a drummer, right, Kim? Yeah, I played drums as a kid. <laughs> yeah, that uh, played too loud. 
And so I went to my dad and said, you know, I need a, uh, I need, I need, you know, like a bigger amp. And uh, he says, what is it? And I said, well, it's a Fender Bandmaster. And uh, I think they probably still, still make it, you know. But at that time, it was 50 watt tube amp and a couple of 12s. And um, he says, how much is it? And I go, well, it's 300 bucks. And he said, uh, he didn't say no, which I thought he would. But he said, is this something that we could build? And <clears throat> that kind of uh, sparked some interest in me. I thought, we can't build an amp, <clears throat> but maybe we can build speakers. Right. And uh, I know he had built a couple himself, actually, back in the 50s. So he was, you know, somewhat versed in that a little bit. But uh, so he came home with a book on loudspeakers <clears throat> and uh, enclosures. And we kind of borrowed a 15-inch woofer from my buddy's uh, dad he had bought for his stereo and we built a bass reflex cabinet for a 15 inch speaker. And uh, that was my very first speaker and plugged the keyboard into it, played some bass. I always kind of liked bass and went down the keyboard and uh, you know, the windows rattled. <laughs> so that was, I think that's where, uh, you know, I kind of got hooked on bass and uh, it was, I'd never heard that before. So that experience, you know, the the visceral sensation of hearing yeah. those frequencies at that level that actually shook things, yeah, kind of intrigued you. <clears throat> Frankly, I had never really heard it before. I mean, you may you stand in a uh, uh, at a parade and you know the big bass drum goes by and it's going like boom boom, you know, and it's hitting you in the chest. I mean, but that was about it, you know, for that time. And uh, so in the band, what we called it was the big bass sound. <laughs> Because we were all kind of like, wow, this thing has got some really bass, really good bass. And uh, so that's how I got started building speakers. But that was not actually a thought of a career or business or anything until actually after pretty much after I dropped out of grad school. So it's quite a few years later. Yeah. If, if you had to kind of, I mean, I know a little bit more about you because I've worked yeah. with you for 24 plus years. Um, you, you yourself and a lot of people just have that Oklahoma mentality. Yeah. It's, it's tinkering. It's we can do it ourselves. And if, if I'm not mistaken, you also had a passion for go-karts. I did. Uh, just about anything mechanical, you know, and uh, I had to take it all apart and see what was inside. And yes, usually broke a few things and had a few extra parts left over. But that was... Uh, yeah, it was, it was kind of the same thing with speakers, I guess, is that, you know, we built that speaker and I kind of got the idea, this is something that I can do. And then I got interested in, well, how does a speaker work? I really didn't know. Right, you know, exactly. At that point in time. And uh, I started uh, buying, actually, we bought JBL Pro Sound speakers and would build the enclosures for them. And uh, they had the plans in the box you know, for building the enclosure and we'd build the enclosure. And that's what I did. And then after that started kind of tinkering with the enclosure size and changing things up. And uh, I did that pretty much all through high school and college too. So definitely a hands-on guy. I mean, I know here on a daily yeah. basis, even though Steve is the founder uh, and CEO, yeah. president of the company, um, your office is on the first floor, which if anyone, if I know some people who watch have been here and actually mm -hmm. been through the facility, but the entire first floor is dedicated to research and design. And, you know, besides right. the business mm -hmm. things you have to do on a daily basis, you really prefer right. to spend most of your time in engineering, designing these products, tuning, tweaking, and getting them to sound how you think they should from a musician's perspective. Yeah. Uh I mean, these days I don't have to do it all, obviously, and uh, but I get to kind of have the ideas and say, you know, let's try this or let's build this and put it together this way. And I work with a couple other guys, Jeremy uh, Brown and Aaron Surratt, and you know, we come up with these ideas and and uh, fabricate them up and take them in the listening room, listen to them. If they sound good, put them in a vehicle, listen to them. So it's. Uh, uh, yeah, it's actually pretty much fun. <laughs> There's a few parts of the job that aren't quite that much fun, but I've been able to, over the years, kind of segment those off to other people and be able to stay where I can work in R&D a pretty good amount of time. So, Hey, how you doing, RVH? Thanks for the shout out. Robert Van Hoy just gave a shout out to you, okay, Steve. Hey, I just wanted to capture him. I try to see the comments as it go by, folks, but you know, sometimes they're so fast, I can't catch them all, but I did catch that one. Hope you're having a good night, RVH. Thanks for tuning in. Um, so I've got, uh, you know, you guys yeah. out there, this is the time if you've got any questions you'd like to ask Steve. It doesn't matter if it's audio related or how he got into the business or anything. Hey, Jimmy Ham, Hi from hey, the SIP. Jimmy. Getting some kicker builds done here yeah. for Audio Center night. You know, uh, Jimmy is one of our, I think he might be our oldest domestic dealer. 
Well, there's a guy who's older than him, but you know, <laughs> but he's been around a long time. Thirty-five yeah. years? Uh, probably so. We started with his dad, actually. So he's been around Buddy, a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, Pro Audio Center, I know you probably see their uh, Instagram posts and face on our posts on Facebook as well. Bill grabs those and reposts them because they do some fantastic work. And when you see mm -hmm. whether it's kicker gear or not, I mean, we love it when it's kicker gear. Right. But they do some wonderful work out there. It would be, it would be a set of guys I could definitely just take my car to. Drop off the keys and say, call yeah, me when it's those done. Those guys are amazing. Yeah. They are amazing. So thanks, Jimmy. Thanks for tuning in and seeing you comment yeah. out there. So if you have any questions, you know, pile them into the feed so we can get those out there. Uh, I'm going to hit Steve with one that, uh, <clears throat> you know, kind of goes along with what we start off as far as the history of the company. But if, if you look at how Solar Designs and Audio started, yeah. it really wasn't a car audio company. No, actually, uh, like I said, I was playing in a band. And so my interest was primarily pro sound and like, what I thought were big speakers. Tell the truth, you know, when I started in business, I thought car audio was a, was kind of a joke, you know. I mean, but really, back in the '70s, uh, the speakers rattled. We had little, you know, four-inch speakers in the doors, and uh, there wasn't really any power to it. And I didn't know anybody that had a subwoofer in their car. Right. And we were doing all that stuff for pro audio. Everything was bi-amp. We were using JBL speakers and Crown amps and and doing really high-end stuff with electronic crossovers and equalizers and all this stuff. And car audio was really not of interest to me at all at first. Uh, things did change after a while. But that, that was where I started. And uh, gosh, it moved from in the 70s, later 70s, we started doing uh, disco systems. And uh, that was kind of fun. <laughs> So I had a buddy that had a, uh, I wanted to tell you about this system. He was building a, he was building a disco club. And uh, so he, he came down and was talking to me. My, I had a little shop and we had a speaker uh, cabinet shop. We built speakers and sold stuff. And uh, he said, uh, I would like you to put in a system in this. And I said, and you haven't started building yet. And he goes, no. And I go, I've got an idea. And uh, I said, are you going to put in like a sunken dance floor, which was pretty popular back then. And, uh, and he said, yeah, I'm thinking about it. And I said, well, let me help you design that. And so when they poured the slab, they sunk the, the floor, but I molded into the floor, had to mold in a big bass horn that was about 15 feet long Whoa. <laughs> into, into the slab. And so like if you looked at it from the top, you've got this square floor that's two feet sunk and then you've got on one side the full side is the is the mouth of a horn that comes back to a chamber right. where we put two 15 inch subwoofers in there and then we built a plywood top and braced it over the top of it you know so it was all concrete except for the top and uh, then we hung oh gosh i don't know eight or ten speakers around it that were two-way systems with 18 inch subwoofers in them as well. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, yeah, it was, it was a pretty amazing system. And uh, that folded that, well, it was a straight horn. It was a straight bass horn and it was tuned to 32 cycles. I mean, it was, you designed the flare rate and everything for the horn. And uh, yeah, it was pretty fun. Um, I got back with him a little later after they'd been in business for a while. And he said, yeah, that table right over that horn is the most popular one. <laughs> <laughs> because I guess we hadn't braced it as well as we thought we did. And so it vibrated so quite it, a bit. Yeah, it vibrated. And so that was the most popular table in the, in the place. So hearing, yeah. you, hearing you talk about that, I mean, I know a lot of people out there, you know, we've introduced the, uh, the new L7X. Right. And we've let them know that it's available in a 10, a 12, and a 15. But listening to your stories of doing systems uh, yeah. back in the day, you, you tend to like 18s. I've done quite a bit of stuff with 18s. And uh, Maybe we'll do more. Maybe we you should know? look at doing more with 18s. Uh, somebody said they'd like to see one. I think a lot of people said they'd like to see one. So maybe I need to twist your arm just a little bit and see what we can do. Well, I think it's already been twisted, Kip. <laughs> <laughs> I can't confirm or deny that on camera, but it's obvious you have a passion for big drivers, well, loud systems. You really like pro sound because it's yeah. about enjoying music in a most realistic environment that you can. Yeah, that's true. And I think that was that was probably the key to the, the original kicker box which was a, a design a buddy of mine had started a music store and he used to come to my, into my little shop back in the 70s. And uh, he called me up and said he'd graduated from uh, university and went back home and started a music store. 
and had a lot of guys working in the oil field that drove pickup trucks and they wanted some bass because in those days there weren't that many really crew cabs is what we call them sure or king cabs you know enough space to put a subwoofer in and so uh, i said well you know what's the space behind the seat in a pickup truck you know i mean what are the dimensions because i didn't have a truck and he said well let me just go measure one for you and he came back and gave me the dimensions it was a full-size pickup truck and so in about 30 minutes i just designed up a wedge-shaped subwoofer box and we used a couple of six and a half inch uh they were actually bose speakers that i used to buy that were rejects they had too much glue on them and i bought them from a wholesaler that sold the overruns and rejects and uh, put a couple of those in it and a passive flat passive radiator in the middle and then uh, i was thinking well you know they could probably why not just make the whole thing full range so all you have to do is plug in two wires and and your system is done and so we put in two motorola horns two by six horns that would handle 2000 cycles on up and focus the sound up and out from the back seat right and so uh, and i was not into car radio at all but we put it in a truck a buddy came by and we installed it and uh, i was impressed <laughs> i'd never heard anything like that either and uh, you know the bass just kicked you in the butt right through the seat and uh, i mean it was it was pretty cool for those days and so i sent it over there to him and he called me back in a couple of days and uh, we were talking about it and I, he says you know these guys love this product and uh, i said um, good i mean i, I knew it sounded good and he goes i i need some more of them and i said well you know we were building them like one at a time and uh, he said you know what they're calling it and i go no what do they call it I said they call it the ass kicker you know <laughs> and uh, you know that was a uh, aptly described the sound i thought you know because it, it pretty well kicked you in the butt i mean it was a uh for those days you know it was something that people had not experienced that visceral just boom you know right there and uh so uh, he said you know why don't you uh, why don't you build some more of these and i go no you know i'm thinking you know my destiny is like big systems this is just kind of a child's play you, you know? just like the car audio I, was just I mean, it was just i was really not interested in it yeah it sounded good but it didn't sound as good as like you know a wall of 18s and and you know horn loaded mid-range boxes and all this stuff and that was just you know so uh, he said no i really think these will sell and he convinced me to try to sell these to some other car stereo shops and mainly because he wanted to keep building them for him. He just him. wanted to make sure he had some. He wanted some. me to get in production so that he could buy some more. And uh, <clears throat> so that was uh, that was how we got started with that. The uh, interesting thing was we had a guy came by and said uh, he was a manufacturer's rep. And uh, uh, I didn't know what a manufacturer's rep was. I mean, I'd never been in manufacturing or sure. anything like that. And he said, yeah, I can, I can sell these products for you boys. Said this is you know i think i can sell a lot of these and we said well how many can you build sell and he said i think i can sell 200 a month and so uh, by that time i'd had uh, the bass player in our band had started his own wood shop so i was contracting him to build the box because i couldn't build them and me and my partner couldn't build them all sure so uh, what we did was we pulled all our money and we built up 200 kicker boxes the original kicker the original kicker boxes and we painted them and you know to to let them dry we hung them on a tree that was outside <laughs> and we called it the kicker tree so there's all these like boxes hanging from this tree you know that we painted and uh, built 200 and had them all ready and this guy just disappeared off the face of the earth never never came back he bought one for his son and, and that was it and that was it no return phone calls no nothing so so you're sitting there i mean obviously uh, young company young guys doing what yeah. you enjoy your passion is high performance audio and you kind of got pulled into this car audio thing yeah so you probably invested not just time but you probably had a lot of money sitting we, there in 200 cabinets so well, probably, probably a big financial every, burden everything we had basically was sitting there we were just yeah i was just sitting there and uh so uh my buddy that was building enclosures don mitchell he said well and I remember clear as day, we were standing there and his pickup truck was sitting over there and he goes, well, I've got a pickup truck. I guess I could go try to sell these things. I said, well, let's, let's do it. Let's put a system in your truck. And he had a camper on the back and we could fit 18 of them in the back. And so he took off and we worked out a deal where I'd pay him a hundred bucks 
for every dealer he would set up. Okay. And this was uh, probably about 1980, 81, somewhere around there. And uh, so he would go into a town and get the yellow pages. Obviously, there's no internet. There's, you know, so you go to a phone booth and get the yellow pages. You're like hanging out in phone booths. You know? For those of you who weren't born in this generation, you know, yellow pages actually a book that had phone numbers in it. <laughs> and a phone booth was what you went into. It was on a wire and you actually put a nickel in it. It was probably a nickel back then. Wasn't up to well, a dime it, yet, was it? It had gone from a nickel to a dime and... And you yeah, made phone. I think it's probably a dime at that point. I'm being a little facetious. The truth yeah. of the matter is, there's some of you out there probably don't even know what a phone book or a phone booth is, but that was reality back in our days. Well, that's what Superman changed his clothes in. Yeah. Very true. It was a phone book, yes, you know, or phone booth. So he would find he he would look at the ads and find the one that looked the best, you know, and uh, like the best shop in town. Go driving around and go up to him and say, you know, hey, we've got this this speaker out in the truck. We want you to listen to and uh, get the owner out of the store into the truck and demo it for him. And we'd put in, I mean, the best system we knew how to do. It, it had, uh, I think we had linear power amps at that time. Sure. And we had a good, uh, good cassette player, by golly. <laughs> and we had the solid aluminum cassettes, you know. Oh, so using yeah, the good cassettes. The good cassettes. And we recorded it off from reel to reel. So uh, anyway, we had our own music. We had our own demo tape. And we'd play it for him and literally... We sold 100% of them. I mean, everybody, because they hadn't heard anything like it. It's certainly a case of the demo of the product yeah. that the environment was made for definitely made the sale. The, totally. The demo did it. You know, it still does, really. I mean, if you can have a chance to do that. I mean, we're still demoing today, right? Well, that's, what we, that's part of marketing's <laughs> gig is we go out and show this well, stuff off. Yeah, and, and uh, in the parking lots, they're demoing to all our buddies. You Absolutely. Know? So, uh, but at any rate... Uh, and we had a sticker made up that would go on the glass on their door, and it said authorized kicker dealer. And so we would sell them two, one to show, one to go. And he would call back to me with the rest of the order, and I would ship it out to him. So within about an hour, you could be an authorized kicker dealer. You got one to show, one to go, and you got a sticker on the door, and we're off to the next dealer. And <laughs> it, was, it was a crazy, crazy time. I mean, we just, it was almost like, baking candy from a baby. I mean, we just, everybody liked it. Everybody loved it. We were in the right place at the right time. You know, thank the Lord. We just, uh, we were there and we had the product. And, and obviously you were motivated. And we were highly <laughs> motivated. <laughs> you know, yeah. kind of comes in, I'm gonna pull some questions out to here. This is a good one. Uh, yeah. Brian Park, he asked, did you have to file a business plan and acquire a loan when you first started or just funded it all with your own money? <laughs> So there's a question from Brian. I mean, how did you that's get this good, thing kicked off? That's a good question, Brian. Well, actually what happened was uh, I had dropped out of grad school and I was like searching for my direction in life. And, you know, and I found this book in the OSU library on loudspeakers and enclosures. And I had always been interested in speakers, but this just told everything, how they were made, how the magnets worked and the voice coils and cones and all different ki types of speaker cabinets. And I just like devoured that book. And I told my roommate, he was a grad school dropout too. I said, I want to start a speaker company. You want to go in with me? And he goes, yeah, why not? That was the business plan. That was the plan. It just... was, the plan was just, let's do it. And there was never, ever anything written down at all. And uh, I had $12,000 that I had inherited from my grandparents over a period of time and it kind of built up to that. And uh, my dad had always said, no, you can't spend it on a new car and you can't spend it on this. And, and so, uh, but it was sitting there, you know? And so I, I remember I went over, I uh, was talking to my dad and I said, what do you think about me starting a business and using that money? He goes, I think it's a great idea. And I was like, let's do it. Let's do it. And so um, we bought a, a panel saw and a table saw and a bench to build cabinets on. And we started building PA cabinets in the garage. And uh, that's how it got started. Yeah. You, and you literally got started in your garage. It was down a uh, little house on Eastern Avenue here in right, Stillwater. Right. Uh, there's actually, if you go to our YouTube channel later on, you can find it. There's actually a video that I shot with Steve. We actually visited all the different locations yeah. where Kirker kind of grew through its history. And Steve literally started this in a very small house, a single car garage and a little house down here in Eastern Avenue. Right. And, and, if, and if, I, if I have my facts straight, you eventually got kicked out because Becky was done with the sawdust in the house. That was true. First... I got married shortly after that. And first we kicked 
Keith out, my roommate. You sure. That was my partner. First, we kicked him out. And then she kicked us both out <laughs> because uh, it was a bachelor pad, you know, and the sawdust had seeped through the whole house. I mean, it covered everything in the house. And uh, so that that didn't fly very well. So we rented a little house on South Main Street, which was just a junk house. I mean, it was built in the 30s and, and really, really, really rough. Right. But we just rented it as a wood shop for $80 a month. Oh, well, that's pretty good yeah. rent. It was pretty good rent back then even. And uh, Well, that makes the $100 a month you're charging us for this seem cheap. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I had a couple of zeros on there, Kev. But, <laughs> it, uh, but that was, a, yeah, started in the garage and we're there for about six months. And uh, actually sold our first speaker speaker set out of there to a buddy of mine because I was kind of in the music scene. Right. You know, I, I knew a lot of musicians and uh, one of my friends uh, needed a couple of PA cabinets. And we built a big one. It was a all tech voice of the theater speaker box, which is about this high, had a 15 inch in it with a with a we had you had to bend the wood. Sure. It had a short mid range mid bass horn on the front of the 15, had a bass port in the bottom. Tuned to 50 cycles, I found out later. I wished it was tuned lower. And I, I always thought, that thing needs to be tuned lower. And I did. And you were right. I, then I modified it later. But, uh, and a high-frequency horn on top. But we just built the cabinet. And all we did was we got the plans from Alltech and built it exactly the way their plans were. Sure. Because I didn't know any better. And we did that for about three or four sets. And then I go, let's, uh, this thing is so huge, you know, let's, uh, make it about half size and and put the have the port be a slot port instead of just it was just a hole was right. all it was make it into a slot port we tuned it to about 40 cycles and made a slot port on it and it really tightened the base up and it sounded really good and and it was about half the size and didn't weigh nearly as much and then the next one was we put two 15s in it and it had a big horn on the front and uh, uh, you know so that was that was kind of when I got into actually designing enclosures was it didn't take very long. You go, I think we can do better than this. So you kind so, of learned from things that already existed and then right. you just went off on your own path, learning, right. experimenting, breeding, yeah. discovering what works and what doesn't. Exactly. And uh, to answer the question on uh, the financing, though, I had no financing. We started with $12,000. And after three years, I had lost $12,000. I mean, I was, I was broke. Right. So in other words, we didn't make any money. My wife was teaching school. I lived on, we lived on her salary for almost seven years. I remember so, you yeah. telling that story to us here in the company multiple and, times. Uh, and basically, if it wasn't for Becky, basically supporting the family yeah, financially, she, this she, probably wouldn't exist. She never lets me forget that. <laughs> <you know? laughs> she, but, as she probably shouldn't, we all deserve <laughs> to have a woman in our lives that yeah. never lets us forget. Well, you know, um, back in those days, actually, Truthfully, we didn't think very much about it. We were making it, you know, we lived a pretty simple lifestyle. We had two dogs in a van and, you know, that was that was our deal, you know. So, um, and that was the way most of our friends were, you know, we were kind of long haired hippies and, and we weren't trying to really get ahead in the world exactly. We were just trying to have a good time. And you, you know, need good audio to go along play with rock it. and roll. <laughs> play rock and roll. Yeah. I mean, I've heard you say it one. I mean, obviously, uh, you did have a or part of a band called Moses. Yeah. Back in your early days, and right. your inspiration or drive from that came from the big influx of the Beatles. Yeah, that was uh, in 1964 when the Beatles toured the U.S. and were on the Ed Sullivan Show, and uh, you know, I was a sophomore in high school, and we all just kind of went nuts, you know, for music and bands and that sort of thing, and started a garage band. And uh, actually, uh, Kip, Paul McCartney taught me how to play bass. Uh, I don't know if you knew that. No, I did not know that. And uh, yeah, he did. And uh, Personally? I mean, like uh, right there with you? I mean, well, he, he's not aware that he did. So it was more like air bass. <laughs> but, uh, well, our, our bass player uh, moved. And so we had no bass player. And so I go, well, you know, I'll get a keyboard bass and set it on top of my keyboard and I'll play keyboard bass. And, you know, I was kind of into that. I still like bass, yeah. <laughs> you know. By that time, I had a piano, uh, electric piano, but the keyboard I had before that had a bass section on it. And I plugged that into my separate bass amp. So uh, so I did that. But the problem was I really didn't know how to play bass. Right. And so what I did was I bought Beatles records, and I would just sit there and listen to Paul McCartney play bass. And that's how I learned how to play bass. So you just learned by listening to what just Paul McCartney did. Just listening to what he did. 
You know, Bob, I'll throw up a question here. Bobby, I, I seen your question there. We kind of answered. I just wanted to come back around to it. Uh, Steve, as he remembers, the first amp that he used on the first kicker box, it was a linear power amp, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that we used in that in that truck. In that truck, it was linear power. I, you know, yeah. remember how big it was? About twenty watts, twenty five watts. <sighs> I think Back it was then? bigger than that. I think maybe it was fifty watts a channel. Uh, I couldn't tell you exactly uh, what it was. It yeah. was enough to make it loud. It was enough to make you know, it loud. What we thought was loud. I mean, it shook the truck, you know. And so in those days, nobody had had really heard that. Uh, we hadn't either. <laughs> Big D, Wilson Audio Labs, he's up there. That was my question. What amps? Love for some old school linear power. Ray will be proud. Yeah, uh, you know, Ray uh, Rayfield. Rayfield uh, linear power is still a company that's around, and Ray owns that, and he still he works does. with linear power. He does. And, uh, yeah, we did a lot of stuff with linear power before we developed our own amps. And uh, the uh, I, I, Jeremy had it up on the screen. I know it's scrolled past and gone by for my – we're kind of shifting gears for a little bit. He was asking – the question was – We've got our KSS uh, six by nine component, which is just the tweeter and the six by nine. Right. And then we've debuted and shown our new, which is the same, basically the same six by nine, yeah. but completely different crossover setup. And it's got the new uh, two and three quarter inch right. middler. Right. And what he's asking is, uh, uh, how different do they sound to each other? What's the big difference between those? Why would I choose one over the other one? Do you want to take that? Yeah. Well, it's for a different application. I mean, they're. It's, it's basically for a factory drop-in, you know, where they have the hole for the middler up there. And what it does, uh, I mean, I just call it like a mid-range slash tweeter, but it just it just plays lower than a tweeter would. It's actually a cone driver, and uh, but it plays up to almost 20,000 cycles, pretty flat too. I mean, it's really nice. We did a lot of development on that driver, but uh, it'll play down to, um, <laughs> 400 cycles, somewhere around there, you know, probably lower than that. So and, that's, uh, so you get more stage up, right. up there. Yeah. So if you've got that location for that driver, what Steve's really telling you there is, and, and I didn't know that, I, I yeah. knew we did a lot of work on that two and three quarters, and if it's playing flat almost out to 20, yeah. you're basically looking at almost the same response of a typical tweeter then on the it's, very top end. It's, it's very close. Um, you know, I would say if I had my druthers, I would probably use a separate tweeter, and I would use that for a mid-range, and then use the other. But you don't necessarily have that appl application. Right. You don't have that spot to put it, unless you're going to get a more complex system. But this is for a, an upgrade drop-in of what came in it from the factory. This is a right. definite upgrade for that. Right. And you can go as far as you want to with it. You know? So really, I think the biggest key there for you mm -hmm. is if you have a location that you can utilize that two and three quarter driver and you're trying to decide, do I do the six by nine yeah. and the two and three quarter or the six by nine and the tweeter, the real benefit to using the two and three quarter is it's going to play lower and you're going to get more of those mid-range right. frequencies coming up off the dash. It's going to help raise your sound stage up than just right. the tweeter by itself. The tweeter is going yeah. to play down to about 3K, I mean, yeah. realistically 3,000. Uh, hertz or three kilohertz, whereas the middler is going to play easily down it's to 800 hertz. going to do another three octaves below that or Easily. So, you know, so, yeah, you're going to hear much more of the full range vocal out of that, you know, especially if you disconnected the mid-range and just listened to them by themselves. Exactly. You'd notice, you'd notice a really big difference. Shout out to Todd Wolf here. Grew up yeah. with a rotary phone, 47 years young myself. Todd, I still remember <laughs> rotary phones. Use them at my grandparents' yeah. house. So, <laughs> right there with you, brother. <laughs> And I go here, agreed. Just trying to find some here. Need to win the shirts. L7R quad, but here we go. L7R quad box is quite a demo for 2021. Uh, that's another call out from uh, Willis yeah. Audio Labs, our friend over there, Big D. You know, we did a drawing with him. Where we actually did a full system, ended up uh, adding some more product to it. Uh, Robert and Brandon from D&B joined us on that. That was a fun time. That was a, that was a good four weeks. Yeah. Had some fun promoting that. Uh, that quad box you know, I've jokingly said the reason we built the quad box, Steve, is because you could. Is that why we did it? Yeah. I mean, we wanted to have a little bit of fun with it, right? We so, did. Um, yeah, that was, uh, I actually got quite a bit of uh, resistance uh, to that box. It's too big, going to cost too much to ship. And uh, they were right about all that stuff. <laughs> but we built it anyway. <laughs> we built it anyway. <laughs> yeah. It is big, and it is heavy, and it and it does cost a lot to ship, and you know, if you're a kicker dealer and you got a freight program, 
you don't pay for it. We pay for it. So and, just uh, get into the program, get enough to get that free for eight. Right, right. And in, in the big picture for us, it kind of evens out. But yeah, if that was all we were shipping, yeah, the freight costs are really high on that. But uh, no, it was a fun box to build. And uh, we just wanted to uh, do something that rocks a little more than what we got. The, uh, that box is amazing. Uh, I want to try one in my home theater eventually. I imagine we can find some for you. Well, well, not, right now. First, not right now. We're out of stock right now. <laughs> but we, truthfully, we sold um, a lot more of those. It surprised us. I don't know, maybe four or 500 of them so far. I don't know, yeah. a lot. A lot. And then we thought we might just do like one run of maybe 100, and that would be it. And they just keep going. And um, yeah, uh, it's a fun box. I mean, I love it too. I mean, I, I like that stuff. It, you know, you've got to. You know, you're running a company, you got to halfway be practical every once in a while, but not all the time, right? So Exactly. Uh, I know Jeremy just threw one up, and we can go back to that one. It's uh, Craft Chest. I got a demo from the late 80s kicker van. Even back then, your breath was taken away. Late 80s kicker van, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that would have been... Uh, it might have been Ray Rayfield's van. With the 918s? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That would have been that one, wouldn't it? I don't I think it had, yeah, did it have nine? I can't remember how many it had. For some reason, as I recall, it was 918. It had enough. It had all it needed. <laughs> it had all of them. Yeah. It was definitely potent. So I'm going to go down. There's. I'm going to look through the feed here. I'm going to ask you another yeah, question, right. Steve. So one here is, you know, we make a lot of different things here at right. Kicker. I mean, it started off, obviously, started in ProSound. Um, you literally got pulled into making car yeah. products that you had no <clears throat> interest in. Right. And then you found out how you could apply your engineering, your skills, and you learned. Right. And obviously, it, it took off from there because we're not known as a pro sound company, even though yeah. it's our roots. Everyone knows us no, as a car yeah. audio company. But we've grown from that into uh, the marine side. We do UTVs, right. ATVs, uh, specific products for two-cycle bikes, things like that. Right. Uh, even our lifestyle products, which have become very popular for us. But if you look back at everything you've done, what products, you don't have to pick one. I won't put you on the spot for one, yeah. but what highlights or products are you really proud of in the scope of Kicker as a company? Well, you know, I've always wanted to develop innovative products. Uh, you don't always succeed at that. Sometimes what you come up with is actually some kind of an improvement on something, you know, rather than just something totally different. You know, I still work on stuff that's totally different too. Uh, some of it has, nothing's come of it, but you know, that's kind of my hobby is to try to think of stuff most all the time <laughs> that would be different and that would be fun to do and that would kind of change the game. But, uh, you know, back, uh, I'll have to say kind of back in the, uh, in the early days of car audio and then when we got into making what we call the separates, which were just separate subwoofers, you know, the, the gold letter series. Right. We did that series. And uh, one of the things that a lot of people were doing back then was they were mounting drivers just like on their back seat and just using the trunk as the enclosure or on the rear deck and stuff like that. Because really, I think the, the uh, technology hadn't moved far enough that people were almost always wanting to use an enclosure and right. tune it and all this stuff. And so I had the idea of doing a, uh, what we call a free air driver. And, and what we did was we built a cabinet that had two chambers in it, each one was about the size of a car trunk. So big. It was big. And then it had removable baffles so you could put in different size drivers. And what we did was we took, and then we took that and we took our competition series, which was the other series that went with it, which went in a sealed box. Right. We weren't doing ported at that time, just sealed boxes. And we set that next to it. And then we took the driver, the free air driver, and kept modifying the suspension to where we tightened it up so tight that it was the same stiffness as the air spring of the driver in the seal box. So basically the compliance of air that you normally have to help control the woofer in a sealed cabinet. We put it into, designed it into the, suspension. the mechanical suspension. And that was the original and, free air. Yes. And so you could mount that in free air. And but when you played it, it had a really nice tight base. It wasn't like loose and flopping like if you put a you know a sealed box woofer just go boop, 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 you know right this one was like boom, boom, really hit hard and uh you know we sold a lot of those and that was that was kind of a fun deal because nobody had ever done that before and uh that was 
kind of pre Solibaric. It was well. I, I can even mm -hmm. admit I was working in retail during that time frame, yeah. and I sold and installed a ton of the gold letter competition yeah. freer drivers. And <clears throat> I know everyone has different. You know, you may have a different goal that you want to go for for your box design, whether it's to be the loudest or to hit a certain frequency yeah. or to, to move a ton of air. But you know, I almost looking back in my my memory, it, it it's not a design that handled the most power. Right. But mm -hmm. from a linearity and a musicality standpoint, yeah. the free air drivers mounted infinite baffle in most automobiles just sounded good. They, they sounded really good. And, uh, and they would handle really pretty much the same power as a sealed enclosure because the suspension was actually as stiff as the other driver when it was in its enclosure, in, in a sealed enclosure. Right. But uh, so that one was a fun one. And I felt like, yeah, that was kind of a new idea although maybe it was a little bit obvious, but uh, it sold really well and people liked it and it worked. And uh, as time went on, uh, you know, people were trying to put more and more speakers in cars and they wanted a smaller, uh, something working in a smaller box, you know? Right. Or we kind of deduced that if you had a smaller box, you could put more speakers in there. Sure. You know, that was kind of the idea. And, and we were still pretty much doing sealed box enclosures, which frankly, I mean, I actually prefer the sound of a sealed box enclosure myself. They're not as loud, but there's no, there's no delay. There's no overhang there's or no, rain. There's no overhang because there's not a delayed signal coming out, you know, that's, that's actually, you know, 180 out degrees out of phase. Well, it's, it's in phase and it's a phase inverter, right. but it's delayed, the time delayed. So this one's going boom, 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 boom. You know, you can't really hear that. But when you listen and compare the two, you go, oh, yeah, that one, this one sounds just like real pure. So often the word tight is used. To it's describe tight. That. It's tight. So uh, you can do a good job with, with either kind, really. But the sealed enclosure has no time delay in it. Right. It's, and so uh, it's very accurate. Right. So that's what we were messing with. And so, you know, some of the guys were doing these isobaric configurations where you mounted two woofers face to face and then put them in you could put it in half the size enclosure because uh, that's the way an isobaric pair worked and you'd wire them um, you know, out of phase because they were face to face. And uh, so that way you could get the same base in half the enclosure size, but you got, you got about two woofers and you got this other one sticking out the top, you know, which is- What are you gonna do with it? So, so I was thinking, why not measure the teal small parameters of those two drivers as if they were one driver and then just dr just design one driver with those same parameters, which is what the Solibaric was. And that would be another one of what you consider the highlights for the company is well, the original Solibaric. Yes, because uh, that's why we called it Solo Baric because it was like an isobaric, but but it was just one driver Solo, you know, instead of having to use two to go in that really small box. Uh, the down, you know, you, there's no free lunch, and so the downside was that you lose about three dB of efficiency, two to three dB. Which you would lose that same if you had two drivers together the same way. You would, and you'd still have one sticking out, and it would cost almost twice as much. So, right. But um, that was a fun project, and to build it up and actually listen to it and go, heck, that thing really works. That's like, it was awesome. Yeah. I remember it was, the. It was really fun. When that first Solar Barrett came out, yeah. I was a, I was working at a dealer. Uh, yeah. I was actually in in charge of the shop. And I put a pair of those 12s yeah. at an enclosure built down to my spare tire well yeah. in the back of a, a Plymouth Laser, if yeah. anybody knows what that car is. I mean, it's, and uh, I had two of those 12s down there, and I was blown away yeah. with how smooth and tight and deep and detailed yeah. that original solar brake round yeah. driver was. It floored me when I first heard yeah. it. It was amazing. That's, that's what everybody said. But frankly, they didn't take off really well selling it right at first because the efficiency was down somewhat, and they would compare it in the showroom compare this one to that one, and eh, it's not quite as loud, you know. They didn't understand what was going on, and, but it was also designed to handle more power, too. So, uh, but, you, but amps were getting bigger. Amps were getting bigger, and unfortunately, you know, people have a tendency when it comes to audio, yeah. the qualitative versus quantitative is sometimes people perceive if it's louder, that it's a better sounding product, right. which isn't necessarily always the case. Louder doesn't mean better unless the only thing you're measuring criteria with is how right. loud does it play. There's lots of other criteria to measure a speaker. So it depends on what you're looking for. But 
loud, just because it's louder doesn't yeah. always mean it's better. Depends on what you're looking for. Look, it's a natural tendency to think it's better, though. It is. And so, I mean, you can be fooled by that. I can be fooled by that. And so what we do is when we're listening and comparing like that, we always attenuate them to where they match. Right. You know, and then do your sound comparison. Saul Gomez, I put you up there yeah. for a little bit. Says you skipped my question. I'm a fan too. Um, repost your question, and we'll see if Jeremy can grab mm -hmm. that. We'll get that to your question. Obviously, I missed it in the feed, but post whatever you got. And we'll try to get to that. I'm gonna go down to the next one here. We got uh, Mark. I'm not even gonna try to say your last name, but I must. Is it Dufault or Defot? Uh, is there a product that Kicker released? Any changes? All right, let's get. We'll get back to Saul in just a second. I'm going to hit Mark's question first. Is there a product that Kicker released that you'd like to revisit or wanted to do differently, Steve? Uh, probably almost every one. <laughs> <laughs> I knew, how did I know that was going to be your answer? I just, you know, there's a well, phrase that we use around here, and I had to use it with, with Ernie, the guy who runs the switching bag. Ernie is, a, is an artist. He is an intelligent guy. He understands the ins and outs of media, 3D production, everything. And Ernie, a lot of these videos that you see running in the beginning of the show, Ernie produced these. And uh, the one where it's actually you and the, the, the gentleman who's actually playing you as a young Steve Irby is actually your son, Joel. Right, right. And uh, Ernie, I remember back in the day when Ernie was working on this, and this that video was a labor of love. And uh, he would, you know, pull meetings together with people and they talk and they would come up with things and he would show where he's at and then he'd have to go do all this rendering. And if you can appreciate 3D rendering, I mean, a lot of that stuff he had to create from scratch and put in there. But when it finally got to the end, I mean, it was done. We, we took it to CES. We used that video to show. But Ernie, Ernie, he was just like, no, he said, I can change this and I can change that and I can go back. And so one day I'm in Ernie's office and I'm listening to him talk. And, and I said, Ernie, I said, you may not be done with it, but you need to be done. Yeah. And that was kind of the way saying it's really yeah. good. It's where it needs to be for now. And as an artist or someone who's critical about what you're making, yeah. obviously there's always going to be something you feel like you can do better, but you have to move forward or you'd never have progress. No, that's, that's true. And, uh, you know, I mean, everybody would kind of like to get absolute perfection, but somehow you've got to find that balance in there. It's hard, uh, frankly, you know, to kind of stop, working on something because you know when we just did a little more we could do this but uh you know you learn over the years that i mean shoot if you ever want to get something to market and sell it you've got to stop at some point in time you do and uh we usually stop a little bit late and are a little bit late because then uh i probably drive people crazy and i'm not the only one but you know i'm guilty uh, <laughs> of that sometimes myself i interject in but, comments um, so you know, uh, you just want to get it the very best you can every single time. And sometimes you get a product out there and then you realize there's something you could have done to it. And so it's kind of frustrating, but generally we wait until we do the next revision of that product to do it rather than kind of trickle it out. Uh, we have trickled some stuff out that we haven't even talked about. We just did it right. because we knew it made it better. But um, yeah, you've got to work with production schedules and and marketing and packaging and all this stuff. So, uh, yeah, if you're a, a designer and an innovator and a tweaker, it's it's a bit of a frustrating environment, but uh, you learn to work with it and uh, you realize, you know, nothing is perfect. No. You know, but you want to just get it as close as you can. You do. You, you mean you want it to be as good as you can make it, no matter what And you is. hope you can always find ways to make it better. That which you know? is the revisions, the yeah, newer right. models, the newer right. ideas, newer materials. Um, one of the questions here, I uh, want to bring up real quick, Bill posted it. The contest entry is at 8.30. It gives you about 13, 14 minutes. If you haven't entered yet, please mm -hmm. go do that. It's uh, kicker.fun forward slash Steve q and I'm sure Bill has been popping that up into the comment section. Go hit that because we're going to close it out at 8.30. And then before we're up and done with the show, we will announce the winners from that. So be sure you hit that. Uh, the question, you don't have to put it back up there, Jeremy. It was something about uh, the Marine speakers. Do you remember what it said? There it is. Uh, something Saul. Like, hey, here's Saul. He asked a question. He's a fan, too. Any changes for Marine speakers? Um, pro for this year, I, I know some things I can't say, Steve. Well, you can say them, but... Yeah, I like my job, though, so I'm not... 
<laughs> here's here's probably the biggest thing for this yeah. year is we've added if you watch the original unmask and then the recap we did last week we do have the new uh, factory mount or flat mount a uh, nine inch and 11 inch cans right. and and honestly and i'm glad you asked that because i'm going to put steve on the spot here but with his uh, roots and pro sound yeah. really that nine inch and 11 inch marine can their roots are in pro sound. I mean, with a horn loaded compression yeah. driver and what's going on there, really your experience in pro sound probably helped us make that product more than it was ever going to be out of the gate. Yeah, I mean, that that's basically somewhat of a, I mean, you know, people refer to, well, we refer in car audio, we refer to pro sound, which right. is a bit different from what somebody in pro sound would call pro sound. Correct. But there's similarities such as horn loading, you know, especially of, of tweeters and uh, mid ranges and this sort of thing, which increases efficiency and and that kind of thing. So, yeah, they have a compression driver that fires right through the center of the pull piece, and uh, it's uh, it's also not a subwoofer, you know, which PA speakers are not subwoofers. You know, they've got pretty much separate um, subwoofers these days. In the old days, they just made the box big enough that they, you could tune it lower. Right. But now, nowadays, it's all just separate subwoofers and mid-ranges. So a PA speaker generally is kind of like a big mid-range. Right. Which is kind of what this is right here. You know, this is not, this has a fairly short throw to it. It's not, it's not like a big long voice call. We're, talk, we're working on efficiency. Right. And also enough efficiency to keep up with the horn, which has got a little titanium diaphragm in there that's super, super efficient and compression loaded into that horn. And so you're trying to make a cone driver keep up with a horn driver. Which is difficult. Which is, uh, that's the challenge. You, should, you have to, actually you have to attenuate back the horn driver because the horn gives it so much more efficiency. But on this driver, it controls the, the dispersion of sound. In other words, it doesn't let it just go anywhere it's got a dispersion pattern, which is more straight back. Right. And so that's, you know, a similarity of PA speakers. It throw, well, th they, they call it throw the sound further. It doesn't throw the sound. It just holds it in a tighter pattern. Controls the beam. If you could think of light as being sound, you're just controlling that mm -hmm. dispersion of the energy, the light beam. You only got so much power. Right. And if you squeeze it down into a smaller area, it's more intense in that area. Exactly. And that's how it works. You're not throwing sound. It moves at 600 and whatever miles per hour, no matter what you do. To exactly. <laughs> you know, so you don't throw it, but but you squeeze it down and, and focus it like a, like a lens almost. Exactly. Know? So as far as answering your question, Saul, I mean, the lineup's pretty well, there are some things coming. We can't talk to you about them yet. When we can, we will talk about them here on the Kicker Unmasked live show every week. But really the new things for Marine, uh, the, the amps have all gone through kind of a transition. There's going to be more power on board. If you've mm -hmm. seen that, we actually have upped that. Uh, and then the new flat mat, the flat mounts for these uh, are a big deal. Uh, people are into boating. They want it to be very loud. They want it to be very clean. Uh, we jokingly talk about, you know, hearing it on 75 foot behind a boat. If you're yeah. towing someone or if you're in Party Cove and you're linked up and you want to have a party, I mean, in that scenario, you're really, it's like having a pro sound system, but it's out on your boat and you can entertain yourself as well as many other people. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the new product I would give a little hint is uh, it's not, it, it doesn't play any softer. Did you, did you just hear Steve? <laughs> Steve just did the patented Kip wink at you. Uh, there are some other things coming. We just can't talk about them right now. It's, and as I jokingly tell people, it's not that I can't keep a it's secret. It's stepping things up, it's, you might say. We are going to be stepping things up a okay, little bit. So that'll be, but stay tuned. You, yeah. you want to know a lot of information, it'll be on here. Uh, here's one here. I'm just looking for more questions. While I'm looking at these, I uh, want to go through here. Uh, your first car audio system that you had in a car. That wasn't the stock uh, system. Uh, the first system I had was uh, actually built with some speakers I was using in our PA systems that I was building, which was a, uh, I was building PA columns. Remember PA columns? I do. And uh, I do. <laughs> I actually built some of those too. And I used an eight inch Stevens speaker, which was a cast frame speaker with an edge wound copper cloud aluminum voice coil, really a high end eight inch speaker. And Stevens was actually an offshoot of JBL. You know, there were some engineers that went off and did that. Sure. Also, Alltech Lansing 
you know, it used to be J.B. Lansing. All those guys, they kind of splintered off. But these were some really great full range speakers we were using in the PA system. So I go, I think I'm gonna put those in the rear deck of my car. And so they were very efficient. And uh, I put those in there and then I had an automatic radio, which you may not even have heard of, Kip. Automatic radio. An automatic radio. And it was a, uh, it was a four track um, tape deck. Um, not it was, a four, it was like a, you know, an eight track. Yes. But it was four track before the eight track. I never saw one. I, let me back up. I never installed a four track, but I know what it is. Well, a, a four track tape was actually better than an eight track for sound quality, uh, at least in my opinion, because you know, you've only got so much magnetic material on the tape and it's only so wide. Right. You're trying to squeeze eight tracks on there you ain't got very much for each one. So you get if, limited frequency if, response. Exactly, especially bass. But if you're just putting four on there, you can charge it more, you know, and get more dynamic range out of it. And so first off, I was had my automatic radio in my dorm room in college playing my big bass reflex box with the Altec Lansing speaker, my first speaker. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, everybody would come to my room. <laughs> Because I can shake the walls just with that. And that thing was probably like 18 watts a channel, you know, but uh, that's what I used. And then I used those Steven speakers in the back. And um, it played really deep, really deep. It impressed me. That's, and, uh, if it impressed you, then that means it was pretty impressive. I didn't know a lot back then, wow. but I was impressed. I knew it was playing very deep. You knew it was there. And, and I was like, whoa, that note was way down there. <laughs> you know, this question, and I pulled this up because it's come up in a lot of the shows that we've done. Uh, Notorious RVH is saying, I bet the Q-Class 1000.5 gets a replacement with a Key 1000.5. Just a guess. You know, RVH, there's a lot of people that have been asking for a five-channel version of the Key. Uh, you could really do one now if you could just take a Key 200.4 and take a Key 500.1, which are actually those two products right there. I know it's not in a single chassis, but that gets the job done. And you could obviously you set up the uh, each amp independently using its setup routines, and then you get the best of everything in that. But man, a lot of people keep asking for that in a five channel amplifier. Maybe we need to consider that, Steve. Um, I'll tell the truth, that is not on the drawing board right now. But some other key products are that I think might facilitate doing what you'd like to do. Is that a good way to put it? Um, Steve likes giving the secrets away just as much as I do. That's sufficiently vague. <laughs> um, there's more stuff coming out of the key out of the key line. There, and I and, keep uh, telling people but, that. But we actually, truthfully, don't have one that's a, a specifically a five channel because we feel like this does the job pretty well, and one will cannibalize the sales of the other, and um, and there's really quite a bit of development in it. There is. And so we're developing some other products that we feel are maybe more unique. So, so you kind of heard it from the man there yourself. I've, I've hinted mm -hmm. around and said that there's other things coming in the key line and they are coming and they're going to be really cool. And you're going to, you're going to like them when we get and them that's released. That's not key line. That's no. key line. Well, I like key line you're too. You're thinking about pie. I am thinking the, about key yeah. line pie. You, I, yes, <laughs> I am. But those are coming. Uh, here's a question from uh, Matster831. He asked, who designed the original Solo X logo? Do you remember that? Do you know? Um, I know I don't. Actually. Was it Chad? It was one of the guys in marketing did that. And we, and we did, as we do on a lot of things, we do quite a few renditions of things. And then we get together what we call our design team generally. And we look at them and we, we vote and then I make the choice. <laughs> that's that's he didn't get that joke. No. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was reading <laughs> over here in the thing. Here's another good question. And you know, we've addressed this one on the show a few times already from Heath Hughes here. So I have a business question. I understand yeah. that COVID uh -huh. has slowed production down. Any idea when we can see shipping back to full strength? Um what do you think about that one, Steve? That's a good question. Uh, full strength, um, end of the year, probably. Uh, Reality. But, uh, but that doesn't mean we're not going to have a heck of a lot of products. Um, you know, we, we have ordered 
heavily, heavily, heavily. So I'm just saying that, yeah, shipping and, the, and all the freight lines, everything is clogged, everything from China to here and, and from the coast to here is clogged up. So our tact is just order more. So we've yes. got more stuff waiting and, and we counted up today, we've got 117 containers of product sitting on the water out there. And so we've got supply, it's just a matter of how quick they can push it through the ports and stuff. And, uh, but our sales are, are very, very strong and we're actually losing ground a little bit. But uh, nobody knows, uh, we're sparing no expense to get stuff in and uh, our freight bills are unbelievable. I know that we actually to keep up with uh, the demand and all the complications that the, unfortunately COVID has caused to the mm -hmm. entire production pipeline from acquiring parts, assembly, shipping uh, across water, even shipping across land here, it, it's a mess. But uh, I know we've gone out and invested a lot of money in air freight to get it here as fast as possible to keep filling the pipeline back up. You're right. We spent a lot of money. Yeah, I didn't want I to mean, get into the exact figure, but it's it's a lot of money. Yeah, I mean, you can give me figures. Yeah, you give me freight. that money, and I'd go start my own show somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it's scary, but uh, it is scary. But the truth is, is that our sales are so strong that it can support that. You know, I mean, if they didn't, there's no way you could do that. Right. It's just a crazy, wild, and crazy time. But uh, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be clogged up for a long time because everybody wants everything now. Yeah, and you know, and there's another stimulus check coming, which, if it does anything like the last one did, it we'll just it just injected, you know, this crazy thing into the marketplace. To, to give you guys an idea, it, th this issue about product availability, it's not just a a, a kicker centric or a 12 volt centric issue. Um, for example, the gear that we use here in the studio to put this entire broadcast together, it's some very nice gear. And we've been adding to the gear as we can because even the manufacturers of products like this are overwhelmed. Uh, wireless lapel packs, cameras, mics, all that kind of stuff. It's an industry wide thing where things have just, yeah. Uh, it really slowed everything down, unfortunately. But I do know that we're on top of it and we're doing everything we can yeah. to make sure we've got what we can get as fast as we can get it. And there's some unusual things that have happened, such as um, 1,800 containers falling off a shipping vessel. That was uh, <laughs> that uh, Apex One, is that the right? Yeah, it's, it, they had to dock in Kobe. They were on the way you know, to LA and, uh, and we had some amplifiers on that shipment. And we still don't know if they fall off into the ocean or not, because they're trying to unstack this thing like, you know, it's just a big mess. It is a big and, mess. Uh, and then they had a fire in a chip factory in Japan that made chips for almost everybody in the world. And that has caused a big, even shut, is shutting down some automotive plants and stuff, because they can't get the chips. Everybody uses chips and everything. That's the computerized world. Mostly Doritos. Well, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, Especially yeah. on Friday nights, yeah. lots of Doritos. Yeah. Uh, Andrew Lowe got a question here, and I don't know that I have the answer to this either, but maybe it's, why is the kicker logo yellow? Originally, it used to be uh, white, red, and black. Yeah. And we went to the black and yellow, I th was that 2001? It was right around there. I think about the time we started using the tagline, Living Loud, we did that. Um, you know, there's probably not a great rhyme or reason to that. Uh, we, especially in the early 2000s, we changed things up quite a bit. Uh, I, I think more than we probably should have, but I was trying to kind of get a new look, something like that. But somehow in that process, we came up with the yellow and black, and I think everybody kind of liked that, and it, it sort of stuck. And that was the same thing with the Living Loud logo. Right. You know, tagline is that uh, we had had America's Music Machines and, and uh, what was the other one we had? We had oh, Livin Listen to the Legend. Yeah, Listen uh, to we, the Legend. We've used several kind of taglines that, you know, we've came up with. And, uh, but the Living Loud stuck, the yellow and black stuck. And uh, now we use the yellow on our, basically our uh, good line and the better line is the red and the blue is the top of the line. So we've kind of used that color coding thing. But uh, it took us a while to land on that. Right. You know, I mean, in, in all these years, you go through quite a few changes. And 
the yellow and black look good. That's a definite. We keep well, coming back to it. It's easy to see. And, uh, you know, yellow and red means food, you know. Ooh, well, that explains a lot. Well, look at the McDonald's logos <laughs> and, and all the, you know. True. The, you know, and so I guess yellow and black means audio, means speakers. There you go. I mean, the one thing that we can't... I just can't, thought that up. No. Well, the one thing that's pretty cool, I mean, it's a good thing, and at the same time, it could be a challenge, because I know that you have personally had people who they find out who you are, and they'll tell you, oh, I've got a couple kickers in my car. I'd love to show you my system. And they'll drag you out and look in the system, and you get out there, and it's not kicker woofers. Yeah. It's a different brand. And, you know, the name kicker is synonymous with subwoofers or high-performance audio boxes. It's just the name. It's become yeah. such a such a solid name that people just gravitate to that they think they have a high performance audio product. They call them kickers. It's almost like, you know, Coke means a soda. Uh, Xerox yeah. means a copy. Uh, kicker means high performance woofers and high performance boxes. I think that was, and especially that in the eighties, you know, when we first came out with it, that that's what happened. And, uh, you know, I thought, well, that's kind of flattering. They're calling it a kicker box. And our, our lawyer said, no, you can't let people do that. <laughs> that's your name. You know, you have to protect your name. And, uh, Heck, I didn't know that, you know, but then she started explaining to me. I go, well, I, I see what you mean, because, uh, you know, they can represent it as being from you. And a perfect example of that was I was buying some lighting for a house I was building. Right. And the salesman kept going on. and Oh, you're with Kicker. Go, yeah. Yeah. Because, oh, man, I got some kickers in the back of my truck. Those things sound so good. They've been, I've had those for years, and he just is going on and on. I go, yeah, I'm glad you like them. That, that's great, you know? And he goes, I just want you to come out and see them, you know? Okay, let's go out there and take a look sure. at them. And uh, so we walked out there, and he folded the seat forward, and it was Becker, which was the first company that copied us with the kicker box. I didn't have the heart to tell him. I just said, I'm glad you like them, man. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, and he shuts the seat back, goes, yeah, I love those kickers. <laughs> Well, but yeah, I was going like, OK, I get it. You know, this is what happens. So that's when you knew you had to protect your name. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so if not so much anymore, Kip, I don't I think because we we kind of begin to send them nice warning letters. <laughs> they get the polite letters. Stop. Don't do that. That's the first letter. Right? That's the first letter. I'm going to bring this one up. I think this is an interesting question because we've actually kind of talked about it internally yeah. is uh, this is from Trina. Uh, B hags, bags, B hags. Hope I got that right. Is yeah. Kicker going to try to compete with the Korean and or Brazilian high power amp amps? Well, I think the one you're probably referring to. Um, first off, half bridge and full bridge. A lot of people think that uh, these Brazilian designs or these Korean designs that they had created half bridge and full bridge. They did not. Uh, half bridge and full bridge amplifiers have been a design topology since the 40s, early 50s. It's nothing new there. Probably the biggest thing, and you and I don't want to get into any brands. It doesn't matter what the brand is, but we've looked at a lot of those amplifiers. You know, claim to make the big power, and they're in these really small packages. And the testing standards that we have as a company, I mean, we expect an amplifier to be able to run into a fixed resistive load for a certain length of time, not blow up, have protection circuitry that'll keep it surviving if you go into too low of an impedance or if the voltage changes. There's a lot of things in there. And, and what we've really come to the conclusion when we look at these, because we bring them in and test them and look at them, is they're built from a minimalistic standpoint as the fewest parts to get the job done. And I know if he's still in the feed here, he could chime in, you know, uh, Big D over at Wilson Audio Labs. He's actually had one of these actually go up in flames twice on his test bench when he was yeah. doing uh, amp dynos on them. Uh, with a reactive speaker load, they tend to last a little bit longer, but they're not, from what we've seen, Steve, we just don't see them being, yeah. that, that design being yeah. as robust or durable. Well, I, I think that's the difference is that you're, you're paying for basically durability and a more sophisticated design that's gonna hold up under different conditions. And obviously, I, I'm the acoustic guy, I'm not the electronics guy, but I've quizzed our guys very thoroughly on that. And this is the story that I get. Those amplifiers are designed, every aspect of that amp is designed to operate kind of, on, you might say, on the ragged edge. Right. And so, yes, it puts out the power. The question is, how long? you know, will it put that power out before something gives out? It's kind of like designing a race car, you know, that uh, it'll go the fastest, but 
it, you know, it may not make it through, it may make it through the race or it may not, but it's gonna need to be rebuilt because you've pushed everything to the absolute limit. So our design philosophy is not to push everything to the absolute limit, but to have headroom built into the amplifier and also have room for user error and also to provide a good warranty and, and very uh, quick and fast, you know, within 48 hours or less warranty service and return and all of these things that go for making you have an enjoyable experience with your car audio and it's not, hasn't broken down on you or hasn't caught a fire. And I'm not saying our product is perfect, but it's designed considerably more robustly. Yes. And then you come to the, uh, uh, the Korean style amplifiers is, is a pretty much, and this is what they're telling me, is pretty much all about the same designs. And we have products coming out that would compete with that, but all of our designs are internally designed. And of course, we think we do everything better. Well, of course <laughs> yeah, we not, do. <laughs> I'm not saying we always do, but there's good reasons why we do what we do because we could just copy things. I hate to just copy things, but you know, if somebody's got a good idea, it's not patented and it makes sense to use that or use part of it, we may do that. <clears throat> I mean, there's not always a lot of brand new things, right? But our amps are designed from scratch. They're and they're. You look at them and you look at the topology, and there's nothing that's copied in them. And they're, we're doing the best that we can with the philosophies that we operate. So I think we'll be very competitive, and uh, I know that, uh, especially the uh, Brazilian amps. Or, of course, now there's. Uh, you can get the Brazilian designs have been knocked off in China. Right. And you can get them from China. And we have those people approaching us all the time just to sell them to us, you know. Right. But we just don't do business that way. And so uh, uh, I think you might get lucky. And I mean, I think the amp's going to put out the power. No doubt about it. And from what we can tell, the question is how long and how reliable. And, you know, exactly. That kind of puts it where into the right yeah. perspective. And, you know, because everything, you know, other than the actual manufacturing, and there are some things we do assemble here in this facility, but everything that happens to a kicker product is right in this building, whether it's the concepts, yeah. ideation, repair, marketing, sales, everything is right. done in this building. And what's cool about it, uh, we're so confident in our amplifiers. Like Steve says, it's our designs from the ground yeah. up. Uh, we have a very stringent test standard we put our amplifiers to. Are they gonna break occasionally? Yep, it's gonna happen. Built by man, broke yeah. by man. But here's the thing, we're so confident that if you take a kicker amp and you install it properly, and here's the key, use the right gauge and wire. style of wire, that yeah. if you do, if you buy a kicker amp and a kicker wire kit that are designed to go together and you install it in your car at the same time, we extend the amplifier warranty out to three years because mm -hmm. we have seen, I mean, our own guys back in the repair department will get amplifiers in that, you know, the amp shuts off or does this or does that and they hook it up in yeah. the test bench back here, amplifier works fine and get working with customer service and contacting either the dealer or the customer come to find out well they're using an undersized mm -hmm. wire kit or they're using an undersized wire kit that's also CCA it's not true copper and without getting into that whole minutia we could do a show on that in the future but yeah. CCA wire does not perform like copper wire you're not really saving money if you invest in CCA over copper mm -hmm. there is a performance penalty and we have seen cases of that where guys are running the bigger amplifiers like the KX 2400s 1600s yeah. and they're not using solid copper wire they're using cca that's actually undersized and the amplifier is basically going into protection it's doing what we designed it to right. do it's not getting enough current it's not getting enough voltage and so it shuts down of course an amplifier shuts down all you see yeah. is it's a bad amp well when we get through to the real heart of the problem it wasn't the amplifier at all yeah it was improper wire and so we are very confident in our amplifiers and that's why we're saying hook them up right the first time and use the right wire we're so confident that we'll give you a three-year warranty on the amplifier yeah. Uh, and I think that's really a big deal to say that in the industry today. And, you know, we're, I think we're even developing better protection networks that tend to maybe roll back things rather than just shut off. Yes. You know, so you have a better user user experience and it doesn't just blow up, but but it, it self-limits to a certain degree before you break it. Exactly. You know, if you've got something like that going on. So... Uh, you know, that's, those are the type of things that we work on. We're very concerned about that, not just selling the amp that's got 
the most watts per dollar, right? You know, but the amplifier that's going to give you great performance for for years to come, you know, and that, you know, you you may pass it on to somebody else, you right? Know? It's not just a kind of a throwaway deal. So, and even another technology, you know, that we've incorporated into the key products and will continue going forward. Even our CX on CX line carries it, is they work in start stop vehicles. Which, if any of you have right. experienced that, that's the vehicles that when you pull up to a stoplight or a stop sign, the motor turns off. You take your foot off the brake right. with the gas, it just automatically starts and rolls down the highway. Well, in those cases, you're getting voltages that are down into the six and a half to eight and a half right. volt range, and most amplifiers will just turn off. They won't yeah. stay on during that low of a voltage swing. Uh, we're going down that path where our amplifiers are being designed with that capability. Yeah, all the amps are, yeah. So, you know, if you're in a start stop situation, they'll work in that. Uh, so, restocking amps anytime soon. Uh, Gino, uh, CX amplifiers, hopefully soon. Well, that's that's a bit of a loaded question. We restock, we're restocking amplifiers all, all the time, the time. <laughs> and, and they're going out the door all the time. Yes. So, so we're not talking about just we get a bunch in and now we're good. It's like no, it's a flow, you know. So the truth is, yes, they're not flowing in as fast as they're flowing out, but it's getting better. And uh, I wish we could find those two containers. I hope they didn't fall in the ocean. That would help a lot. That would help a lot if that <laughs> container of amps is not in the ocean. But there's two. <laughs> we really don't know yet. We're still trying to find out. Still waiting on them to sort it all out. But uh, uh, yeah, we've uh, we're we're shipping out a lot of amplifiers, but we're still out of a, a good portion of them. And I mean, I know we got in, you know, twenty five hundred, eight hundreds. And I think they're almost all gone. Yeah. You know, I mean, they just, you know, we've got, you know, our, our stuff these days, and I'm not saying it's always this good, but these days stuff is flowing like somebody just turned the spigot up, you know, just like comes in, goes out, comes in, goes out. So we can't just say, oh, yeah, they're in stock now because, you know, 10 minutes later. You could be gone. They could be gone. <laughs> they could be gone. So it's just a crazy time. You know, normally, yes, we have deep safety stocks. And we don't right now. Here's another question here I'm going to hit real quick. This one is from Jeff Wallace. And Jeff's asking, he says, hi, Jeremy. Hi, Bill. Hi, Kip. So I guess he's covering all his bases. <laughs> is there a product in particular that you think was a game changer for Kicker and the car audio industry? And he said, posted by Steve Barber. So he must be re-asking the same question that Steve Barber asked. So <laughs> Jeff's just asking questions. So a product that we feel was a car, a, a game changer for kicker and the car audio industry. I'm, I'm gonna give you my answer, then I want Steve to give his okay. answer. I think for me, the one that was a game changer, and, and I wasn't working for kicker at the time, but I was working at a retailer selling products, is when the original round solar barrett came out. To me, that was a game changing subwoofer because it allowed me to build boxes that were extremely small, put woofers into locations I could have never done before and still have great, low, tight sounding bass. Uh, and if you if you go back, I kind of joke about this. When when Kicker had the original comp woofers, um, it was not like Kicker was the first one to have a 12 inch subwoofer. No. But the original comp was a 12 inch subwoofer that you could put in a 1.75 to two cubic foot box and have real deep, tight, accurate bass. Yeah. There were other companies that made 12 inch subwoofers, but they required boxes that were usually four and a half, five, five and a half, six cubic feet. So ironically, I even look at the original comp driver as kind of that first really made for car to work in the realistic volumes that you can do in a car. But the game changer for me, especially at a retail level when I was working, it was the original Solo Barrett. I'd, I'd have to tend to agree with you on that, um, that that was probably the first thing that we did that, that was different. Obviously, the, the square subwoofer set us apart in not only having uh, a potential for more output, because basically it's just a bigger speaker in the same size enclosure is what it is. It just pushes more air. But uh, it was pretty iconic in the shape. We've sold a ton of those, and it always surprised me that most of the people that I would hear that bought them, bought them because it was different rather than because it did anything acoustically. They didn't even know what it did. Right. You know, they go, oh, it must put out square waves, you know. And uh, so I think I learned something about car audio from that is that there's a lot of people that don't understand a lot of stuff that I thought they did because I had worked with it so much. It was obvious to me. And so, you know, I think that that helped me to begin to relate better that, 
you know, it's like, you know, yes, I remember asking somebody when computers first came out, I had a guy that worked for me that was a whiz, asking him to explain something to me, you know, and, and he's like, oh, you just do this, this is not like, I have no idea even what you're talking about, you know. <laughs> different world. Yeah, it's a different world. And so, uh, you know, I think that was a revelation for me that uh, you need to explain things better, what you're doing, but uh, that a lot of people went on the looks, the prestige, the brand name, uh, there's a lot of reasons people buy products other than just because it really performs better. Right. And uh, um, it's the way the world is. Speaking of how the world is, here's a good, another question from Saul. Man, Saul's getting a couple shout outs tonight. Uh, he's actually answering a question from one of the guys. He says, Marine and UTV is the new market target. All these new cars are making it difficult to upsell because they seem happy with their stock systems. Um, Saul, you make kind of an interesting point there. You know, marine and UTV are big growth categories for us as a brand. Uh, that's why you see a lot more product coming from us on the marine side. Uh, you know, the high output cans, the bigger amplifiers for marine. Uh, you know, we've really stepped our game up in marine. We've been doing marine for probably 16 years, mm -hmm. but the last couple of years, we've really gotten serious about it and stepped up our game. And we have a true high-end line of marine products that you can go to market mm -hmm. with. And it's because there is a lot of growth potential in those categories. But when you talk about the car, you know, the thing to keep in mind there is a lot of these cars today are coming with touchscreen radios. They have USB, they have aux in, they have Bluetooth connectivity. It, basically, your phone becomes your audio device. It's your mapping system, whether you're using Waze or Google Maps or whatever you might be using. And so, people are really content with what they get. They got the steering wheel controls and everything's right. there, but what they're not happy with is the factory has shaped the sound system the way they want to protect the speakers more than really give you the best sound quality you can. It may not be enough power for right. you. You're definitely lacking in bass. And the one thing I'll point out, and the reason I brought your question up there is, that's where a product like this, like the key lock, this is where we are making it very, very easy for a dealer or a consumer to tie into these advanced factory systems and do what they want to do, which is get better sound or more sound. If you're just wanting it louder, or if you want to add some really deep bass to the system, whatever you're looking for, this product right here, and as far as I know, Steve, and you can back me up on this, I don't know of any other company that's made a product like this that with just some simple test tones will automatically go through and remove the bad things that the factory EQ is doing to the system. And this does it automatically and retails for 99 bucks. Right. Right. I don't either. I really, I don't. I mean, there's DSPs out there and things you can tweak and tune, but the the key lock, you put it in the system, and if the factory's rolling the bass off, if the factory has all these funky EQs to make a, an inferior speaker try to sound as good as it can, this will remove it all, get you back to a flat 20 to 20 signal so that you can then add amplifiers and speakers, whatever you want. And if you go back and look, I think it was episode six or seven, of Unmasked Live, we actually did a live demo of that here yeah. showing what the key lock does. And uh, we get questions all the time. We may do another episode where we kind of touch back on the key yeah. lock, but you're kind of right there. The growing markets are UTV and Marine, but don't discount car. It's just a different market. You know, back in my day, the first thing you talked about with the customer was, well, let's pull that radio out and get you yeah. because all they had was AM, FM, eight track. And so they need to get a cassette player or when CD came out, I mean, that was kind of an industry changing thing when CD players hit the car yeah, market. Big deal. So, but don't discount car, it's not out, it's just a different game. What you have to do today is you have to integrate into those existing systems that right. if you do, you can get a perfect symbol out of it and then add whatever speakers and bass and sub you want to it. Yeah. It's good to go. I think there's a lot of talk. I mean, we've, we've heard for years, frankly, you know, car audio is kind of dying and, and, uh, and for the exact same reasons you're saying, because the systems in the new cars are getting better and better. People are more satisfied with those. Frankly, the one thing that we're finding is that most of the people that buy our products are not necessarily the you use the new car customer. Right. Is that they're buying a used car, and uh, we are selling a way more car audio products nowadays than we ever have, and so. Go figure. Sometimes you just have to <laughs> smile and enjoy. You know. It. Right. Right. So. Uh, I think the uh, demise of car audio is highly exaggerated, <laughs> you know, as they say. Uh, but uh, yeah, because we're selling uh, way more than ever. And we're also probably growing also. And I think, I think there's a, we have a lot of room to grow in power sports. Although we've got a decent number of products, we've got quite a few products in the pipeline we haven't even talked about yet right. that are actually... Uh, 
most of them are in tooling or finished tooling right now. So you'll be hearing about those we'll get you this. Know, in the future. We're going to release them right here on this show. Okay. Are you? Yeah, heck yeah. The boss said I could. <laughs> Why, uh, why not? Yeah. My, Matthew Macy, do your amps have a health check at startup? Well, basically, yes, they do. Um, all of our amplifiers, we do uh, short circuit protection, and we look at that. We do we look at overcurrent protection. We look at high voltage. We look at low voltage, and we look at thermal. And those are really the key areas that we look at on any of our amplifiers. Uh, mm -hmm. If it's startup, the amplifier is in a, a dead short circuit situation, we're going to turn that amplifier right back off. We don't let it stay on. But that protection circuitry is there to make sure that amplifier lives for the most part in any odd situation that you may come across in an automobile. Uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, they start talking about high voltage, you know, well, why do you shut the amplifiers off at, I think we do it at 15.5? That's around there. I, around, I couldn't say exactly. Yeah, yeah. it's 15.5. We'll call it 16 volts. Yeah. You know, why do we turn them off? Well, because if you've got more than 16 volts in your car, there's probably some other problems you need to deal with. Uh, you get much higher than that in a car, you're going to start damaging electronics in your car. I mean, an alternator can go into runaway and do 21, 22 volts. Mm -hmm. If that would happen, you're damaging more than just your amplifier. Now, ours will turn off. We'll protect yeah. ourselves. But there's other things that may or may not. So we look at all those things, and we try to be as realistic and give you a product that's going to live in a normal car environment as harsh as it may be and it will survive. So yes, we do check for all those things when you turn it on and while it's playing. And I'm gonna look through here and see if there's any other other quick questions, Steve, because we're about the time we need to call our winners out. Okay. Let's take a look here. Okay, here, this, this, this looks like a good final question. It's like three paragraphs. <laughs> John Charles, okay. be sure to comment my name. Well, John, we're calling you out on the spot, John. This is there your you question, go. and we're giving it to you. Did you guys go over what sort of suspension you'll be using for the higher-end subwoofers? I love Kicker and went with Orion just about a year ago. Their suspension sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Have you guys paid close attention to the suspension on the new high-end subwoofers coming out soon? Would love to come back to Kicker when I can afford it. Well, Steve, you know, we're going to end on product. We're going to end on that one. Um, one of the big things, I mean, uh, I'll call out Steve Barber because he has got sure. a build and he's chomping at the bit for teal small yeah. parameters. Of course, we can't give teal small parameters till we have a finalized product. Yeah. But I do know one of the things that we've been working on, and about, I think it was two weeks ago, we actually did another listening test in the yeah. room. I'm here to tell you guys, this new L7X subwoofer, yes, it's going to move a lot, but yes, it sounds fantastic. It is a great yeah. sounding driver. But a couple of the key areas that we're still working on, we already know what the cone's going to be. We already know what the voice coil is. We know what, how many uh, our spider landing is going to be. But two key areas that we're still experimenting on, and maybe Steve will let us say we got one figured out, was mm -hmm. the surround. We weren't sure if we were going to go with a foam surround on the L7X or Santa Prine, like we do on our mm -hmm. other drivers in the line, our high-end drivers. And we're also looking at you know, the number of spiders, their consistency, uh, how stiff they are, things like that. But yeah. I'm pretty sure after the listen listening session we just had, we've decided on the surround, have we not? Yeah, the, the surround will be Santa Prine. And we experimented with quite a few different uh, materials as well as designs. And we've sort of come back to the old standard, which is Santa Prine, which which is excellent, and as it turns out, it's actually lighter weight than the foam for the, the stiffness that we needed. Well, that's good. That's so a so it's worked out great, and uh, you know we run these speakers at at full power for uh, eight hours, you know, with twenty to forty, twenty to eighty cycles pink noise, which is the full spectrum. Yes, all the time, eight hours. That's how we do the testing. If you go in the testing room, these things are like pounding. And so uh, I've heard them <laughs> once or twice. You don't want to open that door. No. But uh, yeah, we uh, that's a good question because the suspension is is highly important on a long throw driver. And this has really been the delay on getting this product out. I hoped we would have it out sooner than that. But we are in the final stretch. And uh, I think we've got one more one more sample of uh, spider material. And uh, that will be it. Uh, we're basically there now. We're just going to try something different. Exactly. Uh, kind of like that. You never, you know, we're still tweaking. <laughs> you know, there's no end to it. But we've got to stop because we've got drivers that. We've got to get this that, out. That do. To get to version two. That, that do what they do. And, uh, and that is 
That is eight hours of pounding at full power. And I don't think anybody else tests a woofer like that. You know, Deviant for Life, I just posted him. He said, foam needs to go, cracks way too easily. Uh, in this situation, that might be the way to go. And that's what we're looking at. We're going to go Santropine. Uh, yeah. Big D's got a shot there. He says, lighter weight and longer lasting. Yes, that's all correct. Yeah. And go down one more. Uh, I'm glad they kept that for the surround. It's light and lasts way longer than foam. So yeah. Chad, a little shout out to you for there. So for those of you who are excited about the new L7X coming, I don't know that there's anyone more excited than actually this guy sitting right here. Um, we spent about uh, three years uh, looking into the market, asking the right questions, getting involved yeah. with the, the big base and SPL shows and, and, and kind of really figuring out what's it gonna take for us to come to market with a product that says kicker, but fits with the, the, the desires of people wanting to go into that uh, arena. And I, th I think we've done a good job, Steve. I think people, once they get an L7X in their hands, they're gonna be shocked. I think they're gonna be surprised and I think they're gonna be very happy. And uh, I think they're gonna realize that this product really, really performs and really, really handles the power. Mike Craner, yay, foam is out. Well, we know how he feels about it. <laughs> He's probably happy. <laughs> there was reasons that we tried it and worked with it. And, uh, you know, uh, but it just didn't, it just didn't do the job. And it turned out, we thought it was gonna be lighter, actually. Right, You know, and it but, didn't end up being lighter. But as we had to layer it up to make it strong enough, it got heavier than the Santa Prine, which was actually lighter. And so this is the cut and try stuff that you do. You know, it's, there's, there's a bit of a experimentation and black art in designing this stuff. It, it doesn't just spit out of the computer. No, and you, you know, you talk about the testing, Steve. Yeah. We do have a room here that's a, a concrete block room that's then got acoustic foam in and they're yeah. to keep all the sound in. And in doing a lot of these thermal tests on the yeah. new L7X, you, like you say, don't open the door. Well, I've gone down yeah. there and opened the door and gone yeah. in. It's like walking into a, a, a person size oven. It's yeah, so it's hot, hot in there. Uh, it's amazing how much heat and power, I mean, heat and power, we're kind of yeah. talking the same thing, that the new L7X will take and dissipate out. And so once you guys get your hands on these, I think you're going to yeah. be really impressed. Um, this driver, and I've said it multiple times on the show, and I mean it sincerely, this driver exceeds what the original Solo X was all about. And you're going to be tickled yeah. when you get an L7X in your hands. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a pretty big difference as far as power handling goes. And and performance in that way. And the reason that room is so hot is because this, this speaker literally blows the heat out of the driver. It does. And that's why it runs so cool. It literally just blow, blasts it out the back. And uh, and that's, there's a lot, it's not quite that simple. I no. Mean, as far as designing the tolerances right. to do that and still move and work right. But uh, there's a lot of engineering that yeah, goes into a lot doing in this. It. A lot more than people want to give credit for. Right. Well, I'll take the credit for it. I, I know you. And I'm here to give yeah, it to you. Thank you, Kip. <laughs> You're the man. Yeah. No, I'll have to give it to the engineers that did that. They do. They do a fantastic yeah. job. Bobby, any plans for Kicker yeah. 50th anniversary? That's been an interesting question. You know, 50th anniversary is coming up pretty soon. We've actually had a lot of people who have asked for a retro kicker woofer. Uh, and if there's any guy who needs to hear those kind of comments, it's Mr. Steve Ruby right here, where people have asked, they asked if we'd be interested in doing a retro, you know, the stippled cone, the original mm -hmm. kicker gold letters. Um, I don't know if we're going to do one or not, but the guy who would push us to do that is him right here. Well, what do you think, Steve? Anything goes. 50 years. Hmm. Stay tuned. <laughs> Let us know what you want. That's I think that's the main thing. Yes. I, at this at this stage in the game, we can probably we can probably do about anything. We probably we've got can. the time to do it, and we're in a company position. We can do it. We can do it. So what's fun? What would be what would be great to do? You know, Matt, you've been paying attention. I can tell. Solo X is the family of products, and the L7X is part of that family. That's been my kind of way to lead you guys into what we're doing here. This is L7X. It's part of the Solo X family. If this is right. the only thing we've showed you, and I said the word family, fill in the rest. So, right. yes, keep, keep tuned. And, you know, that information is going to come straight from here on the uh, Kicker Unmasked Weekly show. We do it right here. So with that said, guys, like I told you when we started doing this, I try to keep it right at 90 minutes. Uh, we certainly appreciate your time tuning in with us. So now yeah. it's time to do some giveaways. And what better time to do it than with Steve Irby right here? That's right. Let's so, give something away. Let's give something away. Let's give away some stuff from your <laughs> building. 
<laughs> Bill, you got some winners back there? Yeah. Let's go to number three. So I'm pulling this out so I can remember. Okay. So winner number three, and we have a winner here. It's Don W. in Aberdeen, Washington. So Don, you are a winner, and what you have won is a set of the EB200 <laughs> Bluetooth earbuds. These are the same ones that you might see myself or the other guests come on the show and wear when we have people on the screen we want to talk to. So you've won yourself a set of EB200s and behind me, actually, let me move this way. You'll get a better view. One of the Kicker Unmasked Live shirts. So that's what you've just won is winner number three. What I need you to do is reach out to Bill Frog. Uh, that's social at kicker.com. We need your name, phone number, shirt size, an email address that is not a P.O. box, and we will get those prizes headed your direction. So that's our third place winner for tonight, Don W. in Aberdeen, Washington. Who's number two, Bill? Number two, whoa, David E. in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Right here, Steve. Look at there, hey. So we got a winner from Stillwater, Oklahoma. Well, I'll just tell him to come on down. Yeah, just, hey, David E., just yeah. come on down tomorrow, <laughs> pick up your prize. But what you have won is also a uh, Kicker Unmasked Live t-shirt. We got you one of those, whatever size you want. And you're going to get a set of the Kush NC over-ear high-performance oh, yeah. Bluetooth headphones. So those uh, are nice. These, I love these. I mean, I have them all. You worked on those with me. To I did. Work, those. Yes, I did. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm kind of humbled by that. Steve yeah. does pull a lot of us in the factory in to work on these projects. And I was pulled in on the sound quality evaluation and testing yeah. on those. And I was happy to do so. And yeah. I, you know, not just because I was involved, they are a fantastic sounding product. Yeah, the noise canceling works excellent. And uh, quite literally, I'll put them up against anything at two to three times the yeah, cost. Easily these easily outperform them at that money. So David E, uh, two ways. We're not joking. Seriously, if you want to come down, send Bill, uh, social at kicker.com. Send him an email that says you'd like to come down and pick it up in person here. You're more than welcome mm -hmm. to do that. If you don't want to do that, then send him your shirt size, a telephone number, full name, full shipping address, and we'll get it in the mail to you. But you can come pick it up right here at the factory if you'd like to. So that's an option for you. That's right. That's, and that's our first winner from Stillwater, I think, yep. ever. And then this is going to be fun. Um, Tim, the cameraman, will you focus in on that one thing I told you about earlier? Because with having Steve on the show tonight, I wanted to pick something that was just a little bit bigger, a little bit more fun, instant gratification maybe. It'll cost me a little more. It'll cost you a little bit more money, yeah. and maybe I'll still have a job on right, Monday. Yeah. yeah, we hope. Uh, Ernie, if you go, could go to Tim's camera, I'd sure appreciate that, sir. So what we've got there, that is a dual 12 inch Comp R loaded subwoofer enclosure. And whoever is our grand prize winner tonight, you are picking up one of those enclosures and a Kicker Unmasked Live event t-shirt. So Bill, who's our lucky number one grand prize winner tonight? Mark C in Waterford, Michigan. That would be Mark C in Waterford, Michigan. You are the grand prize winner tonight. What I need you to do is reach out to Bill. That'd be at social at kicker.com. That's the email address. Full name, phone number, actual uh, shipping address cannot be a P.O. box. And give us your shirt size so we can get the proper size shirt in there. And you have got yourself a dual 12 comp R box and a Kicker Unmasked Live event tee coming straight to you. Thank you for hanging in, tuning in, and joining the show. That's our three winners for this evening. Do I still get to keep my job, Steve? Uh, for another day. For, yeah. That's all. It's, it's a daily deal. <laughs> we get to go day by day. I hope everyone enjoyed this little bit of time tonight. It was great to get Mr. Steve Irby on board. Yeah, it's great to be here. It, he uh, would love to have him on more often, but he is a busy man. And so whenever we can carve out time to get him on the show, it's always a great time. Steve, sincerely, thank you for joining us here tonight. It's my pleasure. Uh, don't kick us out of the space just yet. There's too much junk here. I can't get you out. Yeah. Well, you know, there's this yeah, and there's no, that. No, no, I mean, no. You, they, they say squatters' rights take over at a certain point, so maybe this is just ours. And I think that's it. You don't need a new studio. You just need a new conference room. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, everyone, as always, for Tim, for Jeremy, for Bill back there, and for Ernie running the, everything behind the scenes, yeah. and I'm Kip here, obviously, with Steve Irby and all the Kicker employees. We sincerely thank you for tuning in tonight. Hope you had a good time. There will be a Kicker Unmasked Live next week. Look for the teaser. That's every Tuesday night, 7.30, right here on the Kicker YouTube and Facebook channels. We will see you then. Have a good evening, everyone. Thanks for all tuning right. in.
Thank you, guys.